So, uh, welcome to all of you, Katerina, Anna, and Caitlin. And I'm really excited to be hearing today about the lessons that you've learned from building HR capabilities at some of the world's most successful tech organizations. And in particular, how those lessons can be applied much earlier on in the journey. So I wanted to start off by just a kickoff question. Just briefly, for each of you, what stage in the, in the scaling journey, in the startup journey, do you think is the most critical for building culture and team? I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, we, it's funny, we were actually talking backstage. This is the question that we have received the most, just being attendees um, out and about. And, we joke that is there any HR professional that would ever say, ah, just wing it, <laughs> or like maybe at 5,000. Uh, I think the answer is pretty unequivocally as soon as you start thinking about building a company. Uh, culture starts with, with you, the founder, um, and it grows from there. So I would say uh, it starts before employee number one. And it's hard to disagree. Uh, yeah. I think there is no such a time as n now, right? So from the start. And then it's one of those things that you have to keep at it, right? It's yeah. hit, re hit, and remind. So you can either be in the school of you get a culture because you will have a culture. And, and I don't think it's, uh, it might be semantics, but it's not really about you know, having a strong culture. It's about having the right culture that is relevant for what you're trying to do and what type of company you are. So early stage, um, I think maybe you could have a bit of a sleep before you're 75 people, but I wouldn't recommend it. I think get at it, yeah. hit, re hit, and remind. Culture, culture, culture. Yeah. So I guess I would say I would prioritize transition times. So right when you're starting the company or when you get to a place where you're moving beyond product market fit and you have a go-to-market component, or once you've got the second office, or once you have your first uh, international office, um, or uh, when you move from just having managers to having managers of managers. Yeah. So really paying attention during those transition periods yeah. I think is important. Cool. Well, I think that, that generally validates the premise for this session, which is you know, how can you, what lessons can you apply really early on? So, I mean, culture came up. So, when it comes to culture, you know, when you're, we're always being told that culture is, you know, success is 100% down to culture. And above that, we're told that culture echoes the personalities of the founding team. So, I'm just really interested to know, sort of, Caitlin, like, can founders reverse engineer? for culture, or is culture just something that is going to grow of its own accord organically? I think it's actually both. So uh, I've had the pleasure of being a part of a number of different technology companies, uh, from film at Pixar Animation Studios to the, the Silicon Valley tech world of uh, fast iteration, quick moving, you know, companies are dying as fast as they're growing. Um, and I really do think it's a combination of uh, the intentions and values that you set early on. Uh, to Katarina's point earlier, it has a lot to do with your product and how it fits in. So for example, at Reddit, uh, given that we are, are the home for community and culture and belongingness yeah. uh, online, it's really, really simple for us to take that model and actually apply it directly to our employee base. So for as much as uh, on Reddit you can find your home, whether it's uh, you are a sneakerhead uh, and you love shoes, or uh, you're interested in world news, or you're a parent, uh, it, literally you can find your home on Reddit. So we want to make sure that you can find your home at Reddit as an employee. Mm -hmm. So finding that translation from product which typically is, you know, it's the brainchild of the founder, uh, but taking that value set, whatever you believe in most, um, and then applying that to your culture yeah. back at home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, either of you add to that or? No, I, I, um, I, I think, you know, when you're a founder-led company, a lot of things, if you have a good founder, it comes by itself, right? It comes a bit natural, mm -hmm. and it could even be a bit of cheating uh, if you are very much aligned and the chemistry and the notion of where you're going and what you're going to do and in what order you're going to do it. But I think I find myself to be in, in a position where also I have a very great understanding that culture is important, it's prioritized from the whole, uh, you know, the whole team, uh, obviously from, from, from starting with Daniel. Uh, but it's also so that I have been in other companies where when you have that really cool and, 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 and relevant culture, 
that you want to cling on to it, right? You don't want to change it, and you, you spend a lot of time, or that could at least happen, and I'm not really sure if you have, no, uh, you know, have the same experience, but that could actually be uh, what is a winning bet, could be a losing bet, right, if you cling on, because when you grow, or you go to your first international, or you become a globally, Obviously, the people in the organization is the culture, right? And the culture yeah. is the people. So when you bring more people on, you don't want to have status. Right? That would be strange if you want to keep it. And I have seen so many you know, CEOs or so many founders, and especially if that is the same person, it's like, let's not do anything. Let's not break what's not broken. Let's keep it. And then it inhibit, inhibits like the growth, but also the new people. It inhibits actually inclusion and belonging, which is a really dangerous place to be, right? And it also gets a bit immature, right? You have to grow. It doesn't have to be that you then become a mature grown-up. It doesn't mean that you become corporate, it means that you evolve. Yeah. Uh, and in my case, and at Spotify, Daniel is very aware about that, that as we grow, as we bring more people in, the culture and the values will change. There are a couple of things that are maybe more golden, but, but the culture needs to grow, and we need to let the people also guide us. And you have to be you know, trusting them, mm. um, because people also socialize in a way that the people that are already there will help to vaccinate the people that are brought aboard. So if you're very scared or you are very much of let's keep what we have, I think you will end up in a place that is not that really healthy. But Anna, I mean, I thought it was interesting, Katarina saying, Sort of values changing as well, and mm. you know, think maybe we think culture shifts and evolves, but do the values what changes between values, mission, and behaviors in that linkage with culture do those also change over time? Or, you know, so I think it really depends on the organization, right? And like what works for one does not work for another. Uh, for us, the the one of the things that's immutable that doesn't change is the mission. Yeah. And you know, we, we like to say that's tattooed on the wall. Everything else is up for grabs and all of the people that we hire have an opportunity to influence and impact how we evolve. Uh, but relatedly, right, you know, uh, our mission and our business goals are ours and they're different from yours. So the programs and, and interactions and behavioral norms that we need to develop that allow us to achieve our business goals while being in line with our values, is, it's very unique to us. And I think that the most valuable thing I could say to um, founders or CEOs early in their journeys is to be very intentional about it, right? We, we talk a lot about building the culture as the, in the same way we build the product, right? What, what are our goals? What are the end users? What, um, how do we design it? How does it evolve? How do we test it? Where are the bugs, right? Like, what's going wrong? And let's be eyes wide open about that. Um, so it, it's, it's quite unique yeah. for each of us. Yeah. OK, great. Well, um, I'd love to move on to something else, which is you know, in the early days, the people agenda is really dominated by recruiting. Yep. So you know, one of the earliest HR issues that therefore, like proper HR issues that comes up is about onboarding, onboarding new hires. So I mean, Katrina, maybe, maybe you can tell us something about how you've optimized onboarding at Spotify and what can those processes, can early stage companies apply some of those processes and practices to sort of help make sure that new hires hit the ground running, um, having maximum impact, but are still feeling supported and integrated into the team? First of all, I think you have to then define early days because we still find ourselves to be in hyper growth. So uh, <laughs> talent acquisition is still, you know, uh, uh, first and, and foremost, the, the way that we build out the business. So it's, it's very central and it's very strategic for us. Uh, but then onboarding, of course, if you, if you are still a semi-small organization, you have to swallow that bite, right? You have to onboard people in a smart way. And it is a lot like the, the snake that is too big of a, like for lunch or for, for dinner. Um, so we found a couple of ways that works for us, back to what you said. Um, so uh, hopefully, you know, if the pipeline is healthy and we, you know, uh, screen and we uh, interview and recruit the right amount of people and uh, to the right levels and, you know, in the right pockets of the world, onboarding, a couple of things have been very important to us to find a much more, you know, digitalized, uh, front-leaning, uh, much more proactive, uh, uh, but also <laughs> 
as everything with us, and I guess that goes for you too. Uh, it's very data informed, right? Um, but since we are um, a, a Swedish company uh, with the headquarters still in Stockholm, we have found it to be very good uh, when we onboard to bring everybody, no matter what job or role they have, to the headquarters and spend a week. And for everybody, no matter if they're based in Singapore or Sydney or New Mexico or, or, or you know, in, 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 in Europe, to understand the strangeness of what it means to work for a Swedish global company. You know, the well, FICA. One week <laughs> yeah. makes such a difference. It does. Right? And it does. On a blitz of making the relationships, looking people in the eye, then you can use, after that, you can use technology okay. to communicate. Yes. I totally agree yes. with that, that one. So week. people usually say, like, isn't that very expensive and time consuming? But just to connect with the founders and the founder stories and their mission. and and really make that your own journey, understanding, as I said, the strangeness of the Swedish fika and the, the full autonomy and that we don't really care about titles and hierarchy. It's more about the impact and a good idea is a good idea, whoever comes with that, which is a bit strange for a lot of our good talent and, and superstars and rock stars in Asia and also in US, that it's flat and it's open door policy and, and we don't really care about your background or your CV or what role you have. It's like your idea and the impact you can have here. So the, the, I think if I'm going to point one thing out, it is more the intradays where we fly in and you spend, and it's not going to be that, oh, like, here's my org chart, this is what we do in HR or strategy ops, or this is what we do in, you know, in sales. It's going to be trying to bring people on board so they understand what makes this animal called Spotify tick. Yeah. And how can I make use of that? And how can I start to navigate? So as you said, you know, I can hit the ground and start you know, so it's coming out of the starting blocks and hit the hurdles as fast as possible. But you know, I usually say on intradays, welcome to control chaos. It used to be chaos, right, with the hyper growth. Now it's at least controlled. Uh, and it's still all about the build and, uh, you know, come grow with us. And when you grow, we will grow. So we are still trying to figure it out. But I would say the intradays, introduction, and really vaccinate everybody about who we are, our values, where we're going, and, and why we're doing it. So it's purpose, 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 right? Yeah. It's the why. You know, yeah. I would say, I, we just got a new COO at Reddit uh, named Jen Wong, and she works out of the New York office, and we're based in San Francisco. Uh, and when she came in and did the appropriate thing, which was to audit our processes and make sure that we were being you know, mindful with our spending, one of the questions she said to me is, is it really necessary to bring everyone out for that first week? And I, I, I answered, it is too expensive not to. Um, I, I think that that cost up front, you know, pay yeah. that tax right up front, uh, and, and the dividends will pay. So I, I completely agree. And do you measure that more in terms of retention or in terms of like the impact, like getting getting up to speed quickly, or how can you measure? You know, if you if your CFO or COO is saying justify this might be a multi-million dollar cost. I mean, quite, I mean yeah. okay, so take, take one of the roles that maybe is a little bit more bottom line oriented in sales. Mm -hmm. uh, that ramp time, uh, yeah. if they are remote and they're working and they don't have the connection to the CEO, yeah. they don't have the pitch down, they, they don't know the mission and the, the vision and the values and the way that yeah. people um, that are constantly interacting with these folks do, uh, it will take them, you know, I, I haven't put pen to paper, but I would guess at least 3x to 10x longer to actually yeah. ramp and become profitable uh, in their role. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that applies to all of them, but sales is the easiest. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it, it's, does that differ in B2B? Because perhaps there's more of a sort of product induction required. You know, I'm sure everybody joining Spotify or Reddit is going to be a mad user already. But maybe in, in B2B, there's more induction required on the product side, or not really? You know, it, it's not, there's um, an element of training and onboarding that is sort of in the traditional way, but I actually think that the important piece is the in-between. Yeah. And, and the way that we measure it is we have a, a pretty exhaustive three-month onboarding program that includes 30 sessions spread out over it. And throughout it, we survey employ the new hires and their manager about where they're, how um, equipped they feel to have impact. Because while I think onboarding is important, I want to have I don't want to have too much. I want to like I want to dial it exactly, and we look at the difference in survey questions for people who come out for a week or two versus don't, and it's it's the data is really clear that it makes a difference for us. Yeah, yeah. cool. Well, just um, uh, sticking with you, 
when it I wanted to move on to sort of compensation. Sure. So when you're when you're trying to close a new hire, and uh, you hit an issue around or a, you know, around comp, around compensation, what do you think is more important to stick with a with a consistent comp framework across the whole team, or to know when to make an exception for great talent? And I'm expecting you hit this problem. Yeah, you're in you're in the Bay Area, which is the most hyper competitive yeah. talent environment yeah. in the world. So. Yeah. How do you face up to yeah. that challenge? So um, I'm going to answer your question by zooming out a little bit. Compensation is, um, you know, it's kind of like politics and sex. It makes people really uncomfortable to talk about. And I think it's, it makes people insecure. It makes people worried that they're not being tre treated fairly. And I think there's a couple things that you can do, whether you have five employees or 5,000 employees. Um, the first thing is to be uh, proactive and transparent about what the philosophy is. And this doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be, you know, 10 pages long. But, you know, what do we think about compensation? What, what are our practices? What can you expect of us? The same, and part of that is outlining what the programs are so that people know. And that might mean, hey, we're going to look at everyone's compensation twice a year. It might mean that we use comp levels in this way. It might mean we are we target the 90th percentile or the 50th percentile. But whatever it is, you need to be proactive in communicating it. Because um, if you don't, people will start telling, making up stories. In the absence of that information, they will start making up stories. And those stories are not positive. They are negative. And if it gets really bad, they will take their, their stories and go to the glass doors or the reddits or the blinds of the world. And that's, you, know, you don't want that. You want people coming to you and talking talking about it. So number one is that transparency. Yeah. Um, second, now when it comes down to, you know, you want to have uh, pay equity. That doesn't mean that everyone gets paid the same, right? You want, um, assuming that there's a pay for performance, pay for performance element of your comp philosophy, it means that people are going to get paid differently based on their impact. But when people are coming in the door, you sometimes have a situation where in order to get that person, as you, you have to be outsized. Um, so I guess I would say a couple different things. Number one, there are ranges for a reason, and that allows you some flexibility. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, to a degree, you can trade off equity and cash to try to sort of customize a package that meets somebody's needs while still being in the total um, uh, total comp range. The third thing is you, I, you know, I think a lot of companies get very flexible about their sign-on bonuses to try to bridge a hurdle. Mm. Um, and I, I think that, that how flexible you can be on this really depends on the stage. I think early stage you can be a lot more flexible because you might, you know, you're trying to convince somebody to come out of a very um, secure position to join your, you know, your tiny little startup, um, I think as you get mat more mature, you have a responsibility to be a little bit more consistent. Yeah. And I think that that's really also tied to um, our diversity and inclusion efforts to make sure that we've got gender pay equity. And yeah. um, in general, I mean, the data shows that men uh, tend to negotiate better than, uh, than women. And I, I feel like as HR professionals, we have a responsibility to um, drive doing the right yeah. thing. Yeah. Actually, on that point, I know Katerina, when we were talking last week, you were saying that you've been doing work trying to address gender pay gap. Uh, yeah. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it? so it, it's not really, in this part of the world, it's not really revolutionary because by Swedish law and, 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 and in some parts of the Nordics, you have to do that gender pay gap kind of analysis at least one once years, and, I, and yes, I can't pronounce analysis in, in the English way. <laughs> uh, but uh, so we do that, and then we do regression kind of uh, 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 analytics on top of that, uh, and then we look into the things that could, you know, like uh, performance or, or 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 other things that would be okay. But when it comes to gender gap, then we do that in the pieces of the world where we allowed, for instance, a race and ethnicity, we do that for US, but you can't do that in the Nordics because you're not allowed to keep that kind of track record. Yeah. So we're trying to do that, and I think I totally agree with everything that you said, Anna, but, uh, uh, but, but when we are on the, on, the, on the equity thing, 
since that is something that we have had to do for a long time, what we just decided to do, obviously, that we would have that in a global, as we growing up and, and getting bigger and older, uh, you need to have some consistency. Mm -hmm. So just do that type of things that we, by law, had to do in Sweden and just keep it for the Nordic market and not for the world. That would be strange. Yeah. So that is what we have done with all those type of, and comp, comp and ben necessarily, like the total comp is not a benefit, right? That is a <laughs> usually what is the right and what everybody expects. But that is what we have done with all our policies or, or the programs that we have. So if we think that we are ahead uh, for some reasons in this region, then we push it globally. That goes for the Flexible Holidays initiative, that goes uh, for something that we love and, and, and keep near and dear together, uh, the parental leave, right? Uh, in the so do you have the same policies? Globally on things like parental We leave. do, but that is not totally true because, uh, for instance, in Sweden, you have uh, up to a year and a half. You have your four and eight, uh, 486 days, right? And then you split them between the parents. What we have done is we pushed out six plus one month to all parents, no matter if it's the same sex or, you know, couple or adoption or surrogacy. Uh, and uh, as these two ladies know, but it's only two countries in the world that don't have that legislated, right? It's yeah. Papua New, New Guinea and it's US. So if you're a good, good, good uh, thank, employer, thank you. You, would have, you would have three months. But for, for us in this part of the world, it's like, how on earth are you supposed to come back after three weeks? And then three months, should you be happy by that? Yeah. And then when we introduced six months plus one month oozing back, we were like, maybe that was not. But then, of course, we have to pay for all of that uh, because it's not like set up with the government and the whole system. We thought that that was an uh, improvement uh, and uh, naive, good to be sometimes. I think the feedback from our people, but also from um, the different countries where we operate is it's life changing. Of course, if you can be home with your new, uh, the newest member in your family, together with your partner, whatever setup you have home, uh, the most important part of the of of, of your life. Um, of course, a good tool for uh, you know uh, attracting even better for retention, especially if you have a lot of people in that segment being yeah. you know thinking about starting a family or growing a family. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Caitlin, do you have anything to add in terms of like those elements of strands of diversity? And you know, obviously, we're going through a massive upheaval, thank goodness, and change in our sector. But how is that playing out? Because obviously, Katrina, you're talking about it coming from a sort of Swedish philosophy, which is obviously like, world leading. But how's it, how's it manifesting with Reddit? Definitely. Uh, so there, there's two things. So one on the, the pay component, compensation, uh, Reddit actually believes in non-negotiation. So we have uh, static bands um, and levels um, that actually have different milestones. And so uh, when you are coming in as a candidate, and I actually, I actually inherited this uh, philosophy um, and was, as a candidate myself, it was such an incredible difference in my experience, uh, not having to negotiate. Uh, we, we focus on roles, not people, um, during the candidacy. And so when you come in, this is how, we're, this is how much we are going to pay for role X. Um, and then you, it is married to your, uh, your tenure and then the experience in the, with the interviewing process. And so uh, it, you get what you pay, you get paid, and, and yeah. that's final. Um, and then when you come in, as we pay for performance, we have a knowledge, skills, and ability uh, yeah. career ladder that you're measured against. And so it's a, it's a very um, predictable, and if you were having the right conversations with your manager, uh, which hopefully you are, because we, we've done, in, invested in that training, uh, it, it's a very, uh, I, I like to think, and I like to hope in the feedback that we get, is that the Reddit employees don't think about their compensation. They're focused on the work that they need to do. Um, it's, it's the passing the printer test. So if by accident finance or HR were to actually print off everyone's uh, salaries and someone else were to pick it up, yeah. there's no questions to be asked. So it, it reduces the noise and the, the drama of having to think about what is fair. Um, and to, to Anna's point, making sure that we have a very published uh, comp philosophy document mm -hmm. 
It's a part of onboarding. It lives in the wiki, et cetera. Um, and then how do we, we help? Uh, so that, that, you know, the pay gap doesn't exist uh, in that uh, scenario. Um, and then how do we think about inclusion with our benefits is, is another top consideration. And, and to your point, thank goodness the conversation has changed. Thank goodness people are being challenged on what is fair, what is equitable, um, and, and who we're focusing on, on retaining over the long haul. Um, in, in the United States, well, not in the United States, in Silicon Valley, uh, our average tenure is 18 months, uh, so turnover is incredibly high. Yeah. And what I like to say is I want to be your next employer as well. So how do we think about internal mobility? How are we making those evaluations? Uh, what cadence and who's involved in those conversations? So yeah. anything from investing in, in parents and saying this is you know, somewhere we'd like to invest, the, the, the small change and the small investment to, to make sure that people are taken care of during difficult times, whether they're inviting a new family member in, whether they're caring for an aging parent, uh, whatever the scenario is for life, making sure that you are there to support those people, regardless of the size. Uh, you know, Three months now, six months now, uh, in the long scheme of, of the relationship that you hope to have with an employee yeah. uh, is a very small price to pay. Yeah, cool. Now, I think we've only got a couple minutes left, so I just want to have a, a quick question for each of you. Now, you've, you're all, you've all worked at extremely successful founder-led businesses, so there's a lot of founders in the audience here. What single piece of advice would you give to them in terms of how to succeed in their role as their company scale? Maybe. Somebody else is going to go first on that. <laughs> One single piece of advice. <laughs> um, We're against the clock. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, so the, the word that I, uh, you know, starting off from the first question around when should you pay attention the most? And I think we, we all have these examples or, or these, these viewpoints that it's always important. But I, I guess I'd like to say that if everything is important, nothing is important. So choose the two or three things that you can focus on to influence and manifest and, and evolve the culture uh, in order to achieve your mission and, and stick with those, right? Um, and you know, that might take you a quarter or a half year or a year, but don't, don't pretend that you can do everything. So choose the two or three things that really matter the most. Cool. Okay, short now. I know, so I know. Stay, really pa short. stay passionate, curious. Okay. Oh, that was very short. Uh, <laughs> profound. Um, I would say uh, your job is to lead. Your job is to lead. It, it is very uh, enticing to get stuck in the details, and that is actually not where you can be most helpful. Trust the people that you have hired and lead. Cool. All right. Well, we're out of time. So thank you once again, Caitlin, Katrina, and Anna. And we're going to be carrying on this conversation in the Pink Studio now. So if you want to join in and it's going to be more audience Q&A, please come and join us then. But thank you. Great, thank thank you. you so much.